uh, to, to talk, but uh, it's nice, so uh, dinner will be later, I hope. Um, I'm going to talk about sign language negation, um, and as far as I understood, sign language is a topic that is new to most of you, right? I see nodding. Okay. Yeah, that's good, because then hopefully whatever I tell you will be interesting for you. Yeah? In, uh, in like 45 minutes, we will know more. I've been uh, studying sign language negation for yeah, a fair number of years uh, from different per perspectives, and this already tells you, or, or it might tell you, that there's a lot to say about sign language negation. So here on this slide, I, yeah, I give a, say, non-comprehensive overview of aspects of sign language ne negation that interest me or that have interested me. So first of all, sign language negation has been studied from a typological perspective uh, and from a theoretical per perspective, and both these perspectives I find interesting. Also different types of sign languages have been, uh, been studied. Uh, what you read on the slide is uh, urban sign languages, though so this would include Flemish sign language, for instance, American sign language, but there are also so-called rural sign languages, sometimes also referred to as village sign languages. I'm not going to talk much about these, I mean, close to zero, actually, but it's of interest because uh, there are sign languages that are used in small communities, often isolate co communities because of, uh, of an... Uh, uh, high incidence of genetic deafness, yeah? and this is what we call village sign languages. Also uh, interesting, and this is something I will talk about, uh, people have come up with what I call here cross-modal generalizations and intramodal variations. So what does this mean? When I speak of modal, it means the modality of language transmission. Yeah? So on the one hand you have the spoken languages, which are used in the oral modality, and you have sign languages which are in the visual modality. Yeah? And what we find is that across the two modalities, we find interesting generalizations. And the second point means that within the sign languages, we do find variation. Yeah? And this is, of course, what we expect from a natural language uh, when it comes to an aspect of grammar. And also, uh, there is uh, the role of grammaticalized gestures. Um, and as you see on the bottom, well, these are things that I'm interested in. So I want to talk about typology of sign language negation, the role of gesture in sign language negation, and if time allows, diachronic change. So here's uh, the roadmap. First, uh, as I said, I will talk a little bit about gesture and how gesture can enter the grammatical system in sign languages uh, with a focus on the head shake. And then I will turn to sign language negation. Yeah? And as I said, here my focus will be on typology. And as you can see, 2.3, I also want to compare sign languages to spoken languages. Yeah? So in how far are these systems comparable, despite the fact that they make use of different articulators? And point three, I know it's probably Anne's favorite, but let's see how much time we, we have left. So if there's time enough, I also want to talk a little bit about language change. Yeah? But I will make an effort to yeah, talk like 45 minutes so that we also have some uh, time for, for questions. So here we go. So we start with uh, from gesture to grammar. In sign languages, uh, it is very common for elements, yeah, elements is maybe the good word, for elements that are used as co-speech gestures to enter the language system. Yeah? So, just a random example, uh, I'm not sure about Flanderen, but in the Netherlands this means yummy. Yeah? So, if I, I'm a speaker of Dutch and I do this, everyone will understand it means yummy. D does it here too? You, some of you are native speakers, right, of Flemish? Does it? No. Okay. Yeah? Now, in sign language of the Netherlands, this sign means lekker, yummy. Yeah? So, that is not sur surprising. But what is more interesting is that sometimes gestures also fulfill grammatical functions. 
And people have argued that there are two ways for gestures to become part of the grammar of a sign language. In the first path, and we, we, we call this a grammaticalization path, a gesture that is used in the community first becomes a lexical sign, and then in a second step becomes some gra grammatical element. Yeah, and this has been argued, for instance, for um, the ASL sign can, which looks like this. So if I show you this, then I'm not sure whether you have an intuition where this might come from, but people have argued, based on historical sources, that it comes from a gesture like strong. Yeah, so this, if I ask you what is the gesture for strong, maybe I shouldn't have done it, now I've done it, but though so I'm strong. Yeah? And this also became the sign for strong in American Sign Language. Yeah? But then when it grammaticalizes into the modal verb can, be able to, yeah? then it undergoes phonological change. Yeah? And this is what it looks like. So you also see that it's one-handed now. Yeah? And this is typical for grammaticalization. It's just one example. Because the second pass is more interesting to me. In the second pass, a gesture is, becomes part of the language system in, in like one go. Yeah? So there's no lexical intermediate step, yeah? as there was for the modal verb. And uh, even if you know nothing about sign language, um, for instance, pointing. Yeah? Of course, we all know that pointing is commonly used in co-speech gesture. Yeah? She did it. Yeah, apologies, yeah? but you commonly <coughs> point. Yeah? And in sign language, pointing signs fulfill a variety of grammatical functions. Demonstratives, pronouns, locatives. Yeah? Um, maybe one more example, palm up. Yeah? If I say palm up, everyone probably knows what that means, this. Yeah? It's a very common co-speech gesture. Once again, in sign languages, and I think I put it on the next slide, um, this element fulfills a variety of grammatical functions. It can be a discourse marker, it can be a question particle, and so forth. So this pass, I will argue, is relevant for sign language negation. Yeah, here's the palm up, but maybe this I'm just skipping now. Yeah? Because in negation, um, in all sign languages studied, uh, you find elements that are also used in gesture. So if I asked you for a manual gesture for negation, what would you do? How do you gesture no? I, I saw what you did, but uh, you shook your head. But I mean with your hands. Yeah? I have one here. Other suggestions? Yeah. What did you do? Um, yeah. So, so what we find, I saw like five or six people doing it, is this. Yeah? Uh, you used a full hand, right, with outstretched fingers, and indeed, yeah, if you look at sign languages, the negative particles that you find could be, so this is also German sign language, for instance, and also sign language of the Netherlands, yeah, in Catalan sign language you would do it like this. Are you Italian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe <laughs> it's, maybe this is more, more southern, right, but you're not Italian and you also did it, somewhere up there, probably. Yeah, so um, this is what Anna did, basically, yeah, so like this, no, no, no. Yeah, and these, these are gestures of, yeah, I don't know, rejection, denial, yeah. The ASL one looks like this. This is maybe interesting, but people have argued, is this? Uh, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, no? No. Ah, okay, interesting, yeah, because for this gesture, it has been argued that it comes from an old French gesture, which means I don't believe you. Italian, no. This, this no way. Uh, no, no way. In okay. My original variety. Yeah, then I would like to see the sign language <laughs> used there. Yeah? Okay, that's future studies. So this is the manual part. Yeah? And for the non manual part, yeah, some of you already did it the head shake. Yeah? And indeed, in all sign languages studied to date, and that's a fair number of sign languages, uh, signers use a head shake. But still, yeah, now, now I've mentioned all, all already, all sign languages have manual signs for negation, and basically all of them use head shakes, but this does not mean that all sign languages do it in the same way. Yeah? And this is what I want to show 
uh, yeah, a couple of slides later. Now, where does the head shake come from? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Why do people shake their heads? Yeah? All gestures have some yeah, basic origin. They are motivated in a sense. And for the head shake, people have argued that it is, and this is Roman Jacobson, so the famous linguist, so he has written about the head shake, uh, and he argues that basically the underlying gesture is the head nod. Yeah? So the head nod goes like this, yeah? and he says that it's a visual representation of bowing. Yeah? So what I do is this, glasses almost fall down, um, but, and then you reduce it, yeah? and it's affirmative. And now if you want to express the contrasting meaning, then you use the contrasting axis, so to speak. Yeah? So affirmation is like this, and then you simply use this axis to negate. That's his point. Yeah? And with this, he can also explain why in some cultures you use the backwards head tilt. Yeah? Someone of you Turkish or Greek? Yeah? Do you use it? Head back for negation? Yeah, okay. Yeah? And then... Italy, is south, south of Italy, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. yeah. And Roman Jacobson argues that the motivation is the same, right? Because if you take the head not as the starting point, then you have two options for using a contrasting movement. Either just you put your head back or you use a different axis. Yeah? And then you also find this head back in the respective sign language. This is one claim there's an alternative explanation and this uh, has to do with a child or a baby's experience during uh, breastfeeding that if the child has enough food that can be breastfeeding or spoon feeding then she turns away the head from the food source so to speak and this should be the origin you know i mean this has been argued in the 50s of the head shake and here's a clip so this boy is uh, seven month old and this is an age where children, where babies do not yet use communicative head shakes, because this starts with uh, around one year of age. <laughs> now he goes. It goes on for a while, yeah? but it's just, it's just to, to demonstrate that the idea that the head shake comes from this uh, uh, feeding situation is not an unlikely scenario, at least when you see this boy. Yeah, so that's the origin of the head shake. Yeah, two possible scenarios. Or I have no idea which one is the more likely one. But we all know that head shakes are commonly used as co-speech gestures. Right? So if I say, oh, I didn't say that, yeah, I can shake my head. Yeah? And there are similar examples here on the slide. But head shakes are not only used for negation. As a co-speech gesture, they are also used in order to intensify an utterance. Yeah? So I could say something like, that is so beautiful. Yeah? Or I could uh, be uncertain about something. I could say, what, what did she say? Yeah? So in these contexts, you also use negation, and maybe it's a more meta-linguistic flavor, right? Because what you express in the second case is maybe unbelievable. Also, it's unbelievable. It's so beautiful. Yeah? Such head shakes are also used in sign language, but I'm not going to talk about these. Yeah? So I will focus on negative head shakes. And what is interesting for me, or what sparkled my interest, is once you look at sign languages, you see that the use of the head shake is rule governed. Yeah? And the same is not true for the gestural head shake. So you can show that the appearance, yeah, or let's say the scope of the head shake, is linked to the structure of the clause. It does not appear randomly. And secondly, we also find that sign languages differ from each other. Yeah? So not all sign languages do it in the same way. 
where the head shape appears is subject to uh, language specific constraints. Yeah? And this is typology. Yeah? Languages differ from each other. And this is what I want to look at next. So, re remember that I said previously, all sign languages use manual signs and non-manual elements. And the non-manual element could be the head shake in many cultures and the backward head tilt in some uh, cultures. Now, what we find is that two groups, roughly, roughly two groups of sign languages have to be distinguished. Yeah? And the first group I refer to as manual dominant sign languages. In these sign languages, it is impossible to negate a clause by only a head shake. Yeah? This is similar to spoken language, right? I mean, in spoken e English, I cannot say that is beautiful, meaning that is not beautiful. Maybe in irony or so, but not in, yeah, in usual uh, language use. Yeah? So the manual element is obligatory. And secondly, also important, the head shake usually only co-occurs with this manual element. And I will refer to this manual element now as a particle. It's a negative particle like English not or Dutch need. And here are examples. <coughs> so this is true for Italian sign language. Italian sign language is manual dominant. Um, some East Asian sign languages. <coughs> Apologies. And here I also list Inuit sign language and Turkish sign language. So you can see in the examples, well, I hope you can see. No, let, let, let me first say, no, I shouldn't walk here, then I'm not in the image anymore, right, in the picture. <laughs> anyway, um, these are glossed sign language examples. I will also show you video clips, but just uh, to, to explain briefly, briefly um, we, we notate signs in small caps. Yeah, and then this stuff gives you the word order. Of course, it doesn't tell you anything about what the utterance looks like. And then you see the line above the gloss. Yeah, and this tells you the scope, the length of the head shake. Yeah, and what I gloss here as neg should be read as the head shake. So what you can see in example 1a, the negative particle in Italian sign language appears sentence finally. It's obligatory and it is accompanied by head shake. And the B example is ungrammatical because it does not contain the particle. And I put brackets here just to illustrate that the sentence is ungrammatical irrespective of the scope of the head shake. And the example in two, which is from Hong Kong Sign Language, basically shows the same thing. Yeah? Again, the B example is ungrammatical. Grammatical. Now I'm going to show you two examples. Um, the first one is from Inuit sign language. A student of mine uh, studied uh, the, the language of the Inuit. That's, that's a type of village sign language. It's used uh, in some remote villages in Nunavut. And what this guy says is the Inuk, so the Inuit, do not fish. Uh, they fish with lines, not with rods. And you will see the video twice. Yeah, now it comes in slow motion. Yeah, you've seen the negative at the end, and you will see the head shake. Appears only on the final sign. Yeah. And then, I'm happy I included this uh, example, though this is Turkish sign language. In Turkish sign language, a head shake is also used, yeah, but it seems to be more common to use the backward head tilt. Yeah. And in, Sorry, I, I forgot, uh, there, there were two people who were Greek or Turkish. Uh, Greek or Turkish? Turkish. Turkish, okay. Um, because you have different negative particles in Turkish sign language, and if they move like this, then you get the head shake, and then there's one that moves like this, and then you get the backward head tilt. Yeah? It just means that the non-manual is synchronized with what the hand does. This one goes pretty quick, maybe I'll show it twice, yeah? but focus on the last sign. And, and the backward head tilt, I think, is really clear. 
I, bananas roll. So, these are the manual dominant ones. Well, and the fact that there are manual dominant ones probably also makes you suspect that there are also non-manual dominant sign languages. And indeed, in many sign languages, it is possible and even common to negate a clause by only a head shake. Yeah? Here are examples. DGS is German Sign Language, Deutsche Gebärdensprache, American Sign Language, Indo-Pakistani Sign Language, New Zealand Sign Language, and Flemish Sign Language. Um, the examples on the slide are from German and American Sign Language. And both these sign languages do have negative particles, but the use of this particle is optional. Yeah? So you can see in both examples, um, only the head shake marks negation. And I will tell you in a minute something about the difference between why here are brackets and here there are no uh, brackets. But first, two examples. This is New Zealand Sign Language. Again, only once. And I'll show it again. Next meeting, I go, I. Yeah, I think, again, it was clear that the head shake spreads over part of the clause. And this is the second characteristic, right? So in non-manual dominant sign languages, it is possible and common for the head shake to spread, such that it uh, either... Com no. yeah. This is sign language of the Netherlands, so this is from a recent study I, I did with a student uh, of mine, and this is corpus-based. So these are naturalistic data that we analyzed, uh, and they confirm that sign language of the Netherlands is non-manual dominant. And this video clip you will see twice, uh, and I, I don't remember whether it's slow-mo or not. Yeah, slow. You want to see it again? Was it clear that he stops, well, that he starts somewhere in the middle with the head shake? Maybe one more time. Because the base is strong enough and then a pointing sign. Okay, so what does this tell us? One step back. This tells us yeah, that we have two broad groups, yeah, the manual dominant ones and the non-manual dominant ones. Now, this I already find interesting, yeah, so there is some regularity, there are typological differences, but also within the two groups you find differences. Yeah? So it's not just A or B, but also within group A you find different types and within group B. And what I show here on, uh, on this slide goes back to, to a study that I've done yeah, quite a long time ago where we compared American Sign Language, German Sign Language and Catalan Sign Language. LSC is Catalan Sign Language. Uh, and we find that all three sign languages are non-manual dominant, but all behave differently with respect to the scope of the head shake. Yeah? So let me try to explain. You see, first of all, that the word orders are different. Yeah, American Sign Language has the basic word order subject, verb, object, and negation precedes the verb. The other two sign languages are SOV and negation follows the <coughs> verb. Yeah, so negation is sentence final. Now what you see also in the example is that in American Sign Language and Catalan Sign Language it is possible for the head shake to only co-occur with the particle. But the C example, German Sign Language, is ungrammatical. Yeah? So there's a difference here. Now we look at the examples without the manual particle. And now we see that in C and D, in these two sign languages, it is possible for the head shake to only co-occur with the verb. <coughs> while the same is ungrammatical in American Sign Language. This is example A. Is this clear? <coughs> yeah? So what about American Sign Language then? Well, if you drop the negative particle, 
then the head shake must also spread over the object. And this is example B. So B is good, but A is out. Yeah? And this is only the group of non-manual dominant sign languages, and we only look at three sign languages, and it shows you that also within the group there are differences. Now, I'm not going to talk more about the manual dominant ones, but I can tell you that also within this group we do find differences between sign languages. For instance, when it comes to negative concord. So, here's an intermediate summary. So, what uh, these examples have shown is that the occurrence of the head shake across sign languages is not random. Yeah? There are patterns, and these patterns are language specific. And what this tells me, or what this hopefully tells us, is that the head shake is not just a gesture. It's really part of the linguistic system of sign languages, because otherwise it would be very difficult to explain where these syntactic patterns come from, yeah? and why there is variation. So this means that the head shake is a grammaticalized gesture. And as for the analysis, um, and now we are moving towards what I called cross-modal typology. So how does this compare to spoken languages? Yeah? So in a sense, one could argue that Italian sign language, for instance, makes use of a negative particle, yeah, which appears at the end of the sentence, and this particle is simply specified in the lexicon for a head shake. Yeah, it's a lexical feature, so to speak. German sign language is different, because here you have the particle, but the head shake is also an independent element, because we have seen that the head shake can occur without the particle, and that it minimally accompanies the verb. Yeah, and this leads me to suspect that the head shake is something like, like, like an affix. Yeah? It's not the kind of affix that we know from, uh, I don't know, Dutch, Italian, Turkish, yeah? but uh, it's uh, what you could call a simultaneous affix. Yeah? Because you have the verb, say, to buy, yeah? or whatever verb you want to use, and then you add the head shake. Yeah? And this is something I want to talk a little bit more about. This is what I mean with cross-modal ty typology. So how does this compare to spoken languages? Now, the first thing I think we need to know is that signs, just like words, con consist of smaller units. Yeah? So a word, a spoken word, consists of consonants and vowels, and these are combined in a sequence. Yeah? And a sign consists of locations and movements. Yeah? So a sign like Monday, yeah? you have location, movement, location. Yeah? Other signs, I don't know, like maybe to fly, yeah? they don't have a clear starting point, or maybe they are just a movement. But this is what um, people have called a sign language syllable. Yeah? Location, movement, location. And then you have another element that is articulated simultaneously with the syllable, and that's the non-manual. Yeah? And if in one of your introductory classes you heard about tone languages, this looks pretty much like tone. Does everyone know what tone is? Tone language? Just say no and then I'll briefly explain it. So everyone knows. Okay, so tone is supra-segmental. Yeah? Tone con constitutes a layer on top of the segmental layer. And the same is true for the head shake. Yeah, and now I want to show you a couple of examples from spoken languages, which, in my view, look pretty much like the sign language examples. So here we go. This is Hong Kong Sign Language, the example we have seen before, I think, or maybe we haven't. Yeah? Sentence final particle, which is uh, lexically specified for a supra-segmental feature, namely the head shake. And the spoken language example, that's a language from Cameroon, also makes use of a sentence final particle which carries tone. Yeah, so the little accent means high tone. And this is lexically specified. This tone is part of this particle. 
So both languages make use of a sentence final particle that is lexically specified for a supra-segmental feature, the head shake or tone. Now what about German sign language? Yeah, I said before, maybe the head shake in German sign language is something like an affix. Yeah? So it's not part of the verb, but the verb combines with the head shake, just like uh, a Turkish verb, for instance, combines with a suffix. Yeah? Uh, mi or mu. Yeah? It's affixal <coughs> negation. And this means that in German sign language, the verb is always accompanied by a head shake. I mean, that's pretty clear because uh, an affix always needs to have an element that it attaches to, right? So you cannot just shake your head without a lexical sign accompanying it. So once again, here's an uh, example where we see in the first example the combination of the head shake on the verb with the optional particle. Yeah, and the brackets around the particle indicate that it is optional. And the second example is a language that has split negation, that's Cuiba, a language from Venezuela. Yeah, so you see there is a particle which precedes the verb and then there's an affix that is part of the verb. Yeah? This is what we call split negation, right? like French. And now I want to go one step further, because in Cuiba, the element that combines with the verb is, is a suffix, yeah? just, just as in Turkish. Yeah? But we also find languages where the element that combines with the verb is tone. Yeah? So this is not a tone that is lexically specified, it's a tone that carries grammatical function. So here you see an example from a, a language from Nigeria, and I hope you can see it. Um, the only change is a change of tone. Yeah? So the first syllable on the left has high tone, and the first syllable on the right, which I marked in red, has low tone. Yeah? In other words, in this language, negation is only expressed by a supra-segmental feature, tone. Uh, and I would argue that this is reminiscent of, for instance, German sign language, where negation can be realized by only the head shake. And I have one more example, that's my favorite one, I kept it for last. Um, this is a language from Ivory Coast, yeah? and here negation is, yeah, is fairly complex. Yeah? So first compare example A and B. Yeah? So what you will see is that in the negated example in B, there are two changes. First, there is a particle, which is mu, which is specified for high tone. Yeah? That is lexically specified. And then you will also note that on the aspectual marker O, there is a tone change. Yeah? So in this example B, we have a combination of a particle and a suprasegmental change, namely a tone change. Now we look at C and D, and we see that in this example, there's only one change. So it's only the tone that changes, and no particle is added. And to me, yeah, I mean, you don't have to believe me, of course, but to me, this looks pretty much like German Sign Language. Yeah? Because in German Sign Language, you also have two options. E either you use the particle plus the head shake on the verb, which is supra-segmental, or you only use a particle. No, apologies, or you only use the head shake. Yeah? Um, I should add that the reason for choosing one or the other strategy in this language is um, phonologically determined. Yeah? Um, shall I explain why? Well, it's not that difficult. In this language you have a constraint that says that you can never have three high tones next to each other. Yeah? And the high tone from your perspective is marked <coughs> like this. Now the particle carries high tone 
And the tone change on the aspectual element is also high tone. Yeah? So in cases where the verb has only one syllable, which is high tone, you cannot use the particle, because otherwise you would have high, high, high. And this is banned, so this you cannot have. Yeah? Um, which means that the motivation for using strategy B or strategy D is different from German Sign Language, because in German Sign Language there is no such co constraint, but at the surface the realization of ne ne negation, at least to me, looks rather uh, similar. Well, and I have like 10 minutes left, yeah? So I do want to say a little bit about the di diachronic change. Re remember that at the outset I already said that um, gestures can enter the language system in sign language and if a gesture becomes part of the grammar or part of the lexicon, this already is a diachronic change. And what I want to do now is look at what people have said for, uh, uh, about the evolution of negation in spoken language and then see whether this scenario can be applied to sign languages. Yeah? And here I will probably uh, drop a couple of slides, yeah? but the important uh, thing is there is <coughs> a scenario that is called Jesperson cycle, yeah? by, uh, coined by Otto Jesperson in 1917, I think, yeah? which deals with the evolution of negation. Yeah? And he talks mostly about French and English, and I think I will only uh, look at French for the time being. Yeah? So maybe this is familiar to you, but originally in French there was only one negative element, yeah? and this was the pre-verbal element ne. Yeah? So here you see in early French je ne dis, yeah? that was a negative uh, clause. And then of course you all know that at a later stage the element pa was added. Yeah? And the story is that pa originally was a sort of emphatic element, yeah? an element that reinforces negation and, uh, well, your French is probably better than mine, but pa means step. Yeah? So originally this, this structure was only used with uh, verbs of movement. Yeah? I didn't walk, I didn't walk a step. Yeah, and there were other candidates, yeah, like for instance crumb, yeah, uh, that could have chromaticalized, but for, for some reason it was pa who made, which made the race. Yeah? So people used pa as an emphatic element and then it chromaticalized into a negative marker because obviously it does not have the meaning anymore of step because in the context of a verb of saying, step doesn't make much sense. Well, and then over the years or over the centuries, the original element loses its power. No, yeah, it's a very weak element, and it may eventually disappear. And this is what has happened in colloquial French. So I don't know, maybe if we wait another 200 years, um, je dis pas will be the standard structure. Yeah? And then, in principle, the circle can start again. Yeah? So if you look at Louisiana French, for instance, this pa element appears now in preverbal position, so this is where the ne used to be. And at this point, speakers could in principle add another emphatic element and then the circle, the cycle would start again. Yeah, and here's the same for English, but I think I'm gonna skip this. So this is the C C scenario yeah, from ne to ne pas to pas yeah? and the motivation is that originally speakers were emphasizing negation then the emphatic strategy was overused yeah? and then the emphatic marker chromaticalized and this last one I'm also going to skip now um, ba -ba -ba. what about sign languages yeah? now in the last five minutes I want to hypothesize a little bit because 
the thing with sign languages is that we don't have the historical data to make any strong claims about the diachrony of the languages. Yeah? For French and English you have old written texts, but obviously sign languages have not been recorded in a similar way. Uh, it only started in the, in the, late, in the early 20th century. Yeah? So we don't have sufficiently old data. So what I suggest now, or what I pro propose now, is speculation. Yeah? But what might have happened is the following. Yeah? It might have been that actually the different systems that I introduced, manual dominant and non-manual dominant, are different stages in this, on this uh, cycle. <coughs> yeah? So at an early stage of some sign language, Signers use a gesture, a manual gesture, to express negation. Now, this becomes part of the lexicon. Now, and at this point, you have a sign language that only uses a manual negative element. Well, this would be a non-manual, sorry, a manual only sign language, and we don't really know of such sign languages. Yeah? So it seems that all sign languages use non-manual markers, like for instance, the head shake. Yeah? But it is possible that at some point the signers also used gestural head shakes. Yeah? And in the, time, in the course of time when the head shake frequently co-occurred with the negative utterance, it, was, it became part of the manual element. Yeah? It was lexicalized, so to speak. And then... No. Sorry. Yeah, this is what I just said. Yeah? Once the negative manual marker is sufficiently often accompanied by the head shake, the head shake becomes part of the adverbial, yeah? and then we have a manual dominant sign language. Yeah? Remember, in manual dominant sign languages, the particle is obligatory, and the head shake only accompanies the particle. Yeah? And then time passes, yeah? people use this particle, which is specified for the head shake, and at some point, the head shake may be reanalyzed. Yeah? So in a sense, the two elements that at some stage combined, the particle and the head shake, are separated again, yeah? and the head shake is then reanalyzed as an affix. Yeah? And then we get a non-manual dominant sign language. Yeah? Well, this is speculation, yeah, but in the next step, of course, the original element might disappear. Yeah, and then we would get a sign language that is non-manual only. And once again, we don't know of such a sign language. Yeah, there are claims in the literature that some sign languages hardly ever use manual elements. Yeah, but uh, it's not very con convincing. Yeah? So, I think this is all I want to say about this, yeah, say, speculative diachronic scenario. Uh, no, this I'm going to skip. Well, and here it's summarized again. And here you will see I threw in some terminology from, uh, from, from generative grammar, so I'm not going to go into it. Uh, the only thing that is important for you to, to know is that people also modeled the diachronic change, Jesperson cycle, in, in generative grammar. Yeah? And the same could be done for sign languages. But let's just skip to the last slide. So, two things or three things I tried to show. The first thing was that gestures in sign language can grammaticalize. Yeah, and this argument I tried to make for the head shake, where we find language-specific patterns and distributions, yeah, which to me suggests that this is clearly a grammatical marker and not just a gesture. The second thing uh, I tried to show is that despite the use of different articulators, the hands and the head, the grammatical patterns we find are comparable to grammatical patterns we find in spoken languages, meaning that some sign languages have particle negation. So Italian sign language, one could argue, in this respect is like Italian. Yeah? The difference being that the particle is specified for this non-manual marker. And other sign languages have split negation, 
where one element is the particle and the other one is an, an affix. Now in the third part of the talk, which clearly was the most speculative one, suggests that there may be diachronic change that can be modeled in terms of uh, Jespersen's cycle. Yeah? And this is what is uh, put on this slide, yeah? that you have different stages where at some stage the gesture, the manual gesture, enters the language system, yeah? then you have the gestural head shake. At the stage two, the two combine, and at the stage three, they split again, and one of the two becomes optional. Thank you very much. Yeah, so what you suggest is that the educational system by, by more conventional gestures as a head shape being more recognized by speaking members of the society. Ah, okay. So, so I think there are two points here, right? On the one hand, you suggest that the educational system, yeah, the use of sign language, yeah, or the suppression of sign language may have an impact on the language structure. That's one point you made, and this is certainly true. Yeah? I mean, Fran France is an interesting example because France, for many years, was a sort of role model because France was one of the first countries where teachers used sign language in schools, yeah? the famous Abbé de Le P. And then teachers from France moved to uh, America, and this is why American Sign Language is genetically related to French Sign Language. But the point still holds, right? If a child at school uh, is not, does not get in contact with sign language yeah, or learns sign language at a later stage and is trained orally, you know, you have to learn to speak and to lip read, then of course the grammar may look dramatically different. Yeah, and there may be much more influence from the spoken language. So this is certainly true. Yeah? Now the second point you raised was um, if in such a situation the child would rely more on gestures that are known to the hearing environment, right? And this is also true, yeah? Well, of course, the question then is, is the head shake as a gesture more transparent to the hearing environment than, for instance, this? This, uh, this is, I'm not sure about, but there are, there are interesting cases in the literature of children who use home sign systems. Does this say something to you, home sign? So these are children, deaf children of hearing parents who do not get in contact with the sign language. Yeah? So in a way, they don't have a means to communicate with their family. Yeah? So oftentimes, in such families, we get home sign systems. These are not sign languages. Right? These are more basic, but still fairly complex systems. And it has been shown that these kids also use head shakes, for instance, as negative markers, yeah, which would uh, confirm what you're saying, right? Yeah? And also, they don't use it randomly, right? So, so even for these kids, yeah, which really don't have a fully fledged language, you can show that the head shake, or also, I think what they call like a negative flip, yeah, which looks like this, they also appear in specific uh, positions in the clause. Does this answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I saw something passing high about 
so for example, I was wondering if a possible analysis, speaking of tones, mm -hmm. could be uh, uh, for negation of for other and the other gesture, could be in terms of association, secondary association spreading, mm. just like the analysis which is usually done for supersegmental phenomena like tone origination. Yeah. Let me go back. I skip this. This one. Yeah. So um, what you noted is that I simplified. Yeah. Because what I told you basically is that looking at German sign language, the head shake only co-occurs with the verb. Re re remember that I told you that it's like an affix. You know, like in Turkish, that combines with the verb. But things are more difficult because I said earlier that the head shake can spread. So in this example, you see that the head shake is not only associated with the word, but it also accompanies the object. Yeah? And your question is about similar ph ph phenomena in spoken languages, because we know from spoken languages that have tone, that tone can also spread. Yeah? Sometimes within the word, but sometimes across word boundaries. Yeah? And this is indeed the comparison I, I, I would make here. Yeah? Um, one thing that is important to note and that I didn't say before, sometimes when I speak about the head shake and the fact that it can be on the verb only or on the verb and the object, people ask, well, but that's super convenient, right? Because then where the head shake sits tells you whether the verb is negated or the object. Yeah? Because you could say, mother didn't buy a book, she stole it. Yeah? And then the verb is negated. But you could also say, mother didn't buy a book, but vegetables. And then the object or the whole verb phrase is ne de negated. So people often think, wow, the head shake is a super convenient tool, you know, to indicate exactly what part of the clause you negate. This is not how it works, at least not in German sign language. Yeah? So only the context will tell you whether the intention here is negation of the verb or in negation of the, the word phrase. And if you want to make clear that only the object is negated, meaning she didn't buy books but vegetables, then you would topicalize the object. Then you would say books, mother, not buy, yeah? and then vegetables. This is how you would do it. Yeah? But this was not your question. Your question was about spreading. Mm. Yeah? The linking and linking and other tonal mechanisms which are used in spoken languages yeah. uh, or international languages languages to represent supersegmentals if this came Yeah, into and this is exactly the comparison I would want to make. I have a paper, 2016, which I'd be happy to, to send, where I make exactly this co comparison. Yeah? Tones and non-manuals and spreading in the two modalities. I noticed you were just nodding on vegetables. Is that what yeah. you're Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, once again, yeah, I'm not a native signer, of course, but this is what you would probably do. Yeah? If you negate the book, yeah? book mother didn't buy, vegetables she did, then you nod on the vegetables. Yeah, that's true. More questions? Yeah, exactly. It need not be about negation. Okay, okay. thank you.